Well, what skills will organizations need to deal with climate change? To talk about that, I'm joined by Stephen Rothstein. He's the founding managing director of the Cirrus Accelerator for Sustainable Capital Markets. Steve, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for the kind invitation, Linda. Well, it's such an interesting topic. It's one I've become much more involved in the last few years from a workplace perspective. But I'd like to hear how you got to be the expert in this field. Like, tell me about your own career and how Cirrus came to, to happen. Well, so Ceres is, uh, this is our 35th year of service and we have a few hundred employees and we work with folks all over the country and all over the world. Uh, where our investors, for example, represent $44 trillion of assets under management, work with some of the largest companies, policymakers. And our basic belief is that climate is a significant factor for all businesses. There is both significant risks with fires, floods, tornadoes, and other things, transition risks, and significant opportunities. And so the companies that understand their climate risks and opportunities are gonna do better financially. And uh, we also work on water and a variety of other topics. You know, I think these days you probably have a lot of buy into that. I'm thinking back to 35 years ago. What was it like then? Not at all. Yeah, it was very, very different. I mean, you know, we talked about for 20 years, we've been talking about this concept that climate risk is financial risk. Mm -hmm. And up until the last several years, people didn't really accept that. Um, it, like climate was seen, oh, we'll, we'll have our philanthropy department deal with something there. Yeah. It's kind of an issue for, like I used to say, you used to think about it for your grandkids. Now you think about it for yourself because it's affecting um, where people live. You know, in the United States last year, uh, twice as many people died because of heat than any other exposure. Three and a half, over three million people were forced to move in the United States alone um, because of climate issues, because of fires, floods, tornadoes, that uh, we're having more and more significant events. And there's also enormous big opportunities with the growth of renewable energy technology. So yeah, it's it's been um, building momentum, but now there is broad awareness, even in a polarized political environment. I want to get to the work aspects of this, but it is interesting. Do you think these risks are fully reflected in valuations? Absolutely not. Yeah. No, no. That, that I'll give you an example that, you know, in 08 with the banking crisis, and that took, you know, a decade to work itself through. We've done analysis and other people have. There is more climate risk in the balance sheet of banks today than there was of subprime in 08. More. And it's not fully reflected. So people are addressing it more, but it's still underreported. And that's really frightening to me because I'm an economist by training. And the idea that there is the potential for this to take down the US economy and the world economy because people aren't paying a lot of attention, it's pretty frightening. It is frightening. Yeah. Again, if you think about it just as context, so the, so the US federal government in the 80s said we had $1 billion storm every Three, every every four months, excuse me. Last year, we had it every 12 days. And so places all over, and again, all over the world, uh, people are, whether it be losing their livelihoods or their lives um, because of floods, fires, heat, transition. If you're a company, for example, that makes spark plugs, uh, well, if, if, if the EV market grows, they don't have spark plugs. So think about all of the changes in the transition in the economy. If you got your, if, if your company gets its parts through the Panama Canal. Well, the Panama Canal, because of the drought now, has 40% less ships going through. So it, it is affecting businesses all over, whether because of a physical risk, a transition risk, or a supply risk. So if you're an organization, whether the public or private sector or wherever, you really should have a plan to deal with this. But from my reading on this, companies don't even have the right skills in-house. What would you like to see them do? And what kind of people do you think they need? So first is we started at the board level. Um, board needs to be educated. We actually have a core, an online course. If we go to University of Michigan or Ceres and uh, we have a course on climate and ESG. So boards need to be educated just like they do on other strategic issues. Um, second is that when you get to the senior management, they also need to be educated, but we also think it should be incorporated into compensation. It's not the only risk, obviously lots of others, but to build there. And then there needs to be a clear accountability line. And there is not just a department because it affects finance and it affects supply chain and it affects procurement and many other things as part of that. And then we think every major company needs to both first today have climate disclosure, publicly say, here's what we're, our disclosure is, and then to have a plan. 
by 2030, 2040, 2050, here's where we want to get to. Um, any big problem, whether it be pandemic, cyber, inflation, you need to both know where you are today and have a plan where you want to go in the future. Climate is a big risk and a big opportunity. Every company needs to know where they are today and have a plan to go forward. Okay, let's take that a bit at a time. You mentioned inflation. Okay, so you have an economics team in-house, you have finance experts, they're going to brief the board on inflation. Who's briefing the board on climate? Uh, well, uh, most companies, most large companies now have a chief sustainability officer, um, and some have a big department. Um, some may have one person. Um, but again, climate, it, it's, not, it's not a standalone issue like the economy isn't. It affects everything you're doing. It affects your public relations. It affects your suppliers. Uh, I know a company that, for example, when they look at their big suppliers, if, if their supply chain is in the line of a fire or flood, they ask for a backup location. Um, and it, it, it affects the finance, it affects everything else. Um, some people would argue that if the, if the real price of the oil company, for example, of closing the wells, that it would depress their valuation. Um, so it affects your investment portfolio. It affects every element of that. So companies are at different levels of preparedness, um, a lot more than they were, but we're not, we have so much more to go. Do you have an example of one that you'd say is doing it right? Well, I, I wouldn't say, I mean, there's more that every company can do, but there's some of the large technology companies, Apple and Microsoft and Salesforce, that have really taken a step forward. And there are some large industrial companies. There are steel companies, there are agricultural companies, there are car companies that are all moving forward. We have dozens that are in what we call our company network. They're all on our website, series.org. Um, and so there's a lot of exciting things companies are doing, but we have to go from having a corporate leader, an early adopter, to tens of thousands of companies doing some of these things. So if you're hiring plans. people, sorry, if you're hiring people, you know, there's different skills you look for. There's different capabilities. Given that we have this crisis ahead of us, is there something special you'd like to see in hires and potential leaders? Yeah, that, that there are many companies I know that view this as part of everyone's job. Because whatever you're doing, it's part of it. So depending on, first, it depends on the industry, um, whether you need, some people need a scientist or an engineer to really understand climate science. Others just need a, a management, you know, who can, who can manage a process and work with their, again, their suppliers, their employers. Um, there is a growing legal issue. The number of lawsuits have tripled in the last several years. Uh, there is a growing regulatory set of issues of depending on some people think it's too fast, some people think it's too slow, um, depending on all different where you are in the world. Um, but there's more regulatory. So it it's really you need to have people involved, but you really what you need is to have a cross cutting team, um, somebody from your finance and from your legal and from your procurement and from your HR uh, on a cross com, cross cutting climate management team. Okay, so let's assume you have some of that in place. You mentioned disclosure. I know what you're talking about disclosure, how much energy is used and the things that um, that we're most familiar with. I'm curious, when you think about remote work, if you have a company that tells everyone to come to work five days a week, that company is one way or another creating a larger carbon footprint than others. Do you think there's going to be pressure on those companies, not to disclose, but also to change policies to be more climate friendly? Yeah, um, you know, climate, like any business issue, is complicated. There's no one answer fits everyone. So yes, I mean, if if you're if you have to come to the office five days a week, it does create more emissions. There may be offsetting factors depending on how big the company is, where people are, uh, what kind of synergies there are. So again, I, I there's not one answer, one size fits all. But climate should be that's that was a that's a great example that climate should be consideration everything you're doing. So your HR decisions, that is a perfect example to think about it. And uh, you have to look at that. You know, as companies are using more AI, Microsoft has said publicly that their carbon footprint is growing by about 30% because of AI. So they have to look for other initiatives to get to net zero. So it is important whether you're looking at technology, human resources, pandemic planning, or uh, other factors. 
you think we're going to have to see large scale infrastructure changes I mean, changes to office buildings changes to where they're situated is this going to be you know a workplace transition that's part of this i think there'll be a variety of factors so for, first is this is a uh the, the the it's been suggested by the un and iea and others that we're now spending around two trillion dollars a year on energy renewable energy and new emerging technology that two trillion has to go to four trillion that is massive amount of opportunities and so whether you're in the ev business or other kinds of transportation or communication it will affect you in a big way um will it lead to more remote work it, it is again one of those factors um, you know, the the many countries, U.S. is one of them, was built based on using your car, everyone having a private car, taking you from the suburbs. So I think, you know, those kinds of changes are long term um, and it took decades to build it up and it takes going to take decades to change them. But I do think it'll have some impact, um, you know, that there are U.S. is guilty for using a lot more energy per person than other places. And we have to look seriously at that and on again from where you work to what you eat okay let's talk about the generational side of this gen the generation z generation alpha care a lot about these issues correct do you think that will spur how organizations do things right now i know a lot of them talk about this but the greenwashing effect is real i think there's so much skepticism about what companies are really doing uh do you think we're going to see a lot of changes in the years ahead Yes, I think that what we're what we're seeing is first the pace of crisis is growing, floods, fires, tornadoes, and that's creating awareness. It used to be that most people didn't know someone who was impacted by fires, floods, tornadoes, et cetera. Now that that is not happening. More and more people are. Um, you know, whether it be the smoke from Canada or the floods in Florida or the fires in California, or you know, a third of the country in in, in Pakistan was forced to move because of the rain. So yes, I think the problems are growing and younger generation is demanding more action. And there are lots of studies that show that, um, that given two jobs, they, they, wanna, they overwhelmingly wanna work for a company that, um, that reflects their values, but it's also investors, uh, uh, investors representing tens of trillions of dollars have set net zero plans. So they then go to their companies and through shareholder resolutions or dialogues. So yeah, we are seeing a pace of change. Um, the challenge is we're also seeing a pace of change in, the, in, the, in what Mother Nature is doing. So we have to move faster. Okay, so if there's a leader listening and they're, are, they're somewhat overwhelmed because so much is happening and they probably don't have the resources, don't know where to start, what's your advice here? What are the first things you need to do? And what are the things you need to do over the next five years? Yeah. So uh, I guess three things. First is understand what your current emission profile is like and disclose that publicly. So here's what we're doing now. And second is to put a plan together. It's not gonna be perfect. No plan is initially perfect, but put it together and then update it uh, every few years. And then third is hire really smart people, staff, consultants, so that you can get updates on this. Just like, you know, you think about, it, if I said, what would you do if you're overwhelmed by the issues of, cyber or of crypto or of inflation you do the same thing you figure out where you are now you figure out what your plan is and you hire people to work on them and and that climate is one of those issues it also can be an enormous upside because of customer interest employee uh, uh, um, uh, press community if it's done in a responsible way if someone is thinking of becoming an expert in climate some younger people are going through what are the skills they should be developing well, there's two directions. One is a technical direction where you become a climate scientist or an engineer, and, and we need a lot of people in those areas. But then there's also more general business, um, management, MBA. Um, and again, if, if you're an HR or uh, you're gonna be on the procurement front or a lawyer, understand climate issues. So I'd say whatever your career is, understand how climate affects it. Uh, whether you're going to be a climate expert or not, in your career, you'll be asked to work on it more and more and more. It's not just, again, I have an adorable granddaughter that's 18 months old, and I think about what life's going to be like when she goes to college. 
you know, in 2040, but it's literally what's affecting us this year, next year, and the year after. And final question, Steve, are you an optimist in all this? Do you think we'll get it right? I'm an incurable optimist. Oh, I'm good. an incurable optimist. And um, I have lots of reasons to be that way. And, you know, we'll get it right after getting it wrong. Meaning, in other words, we'll make mistakes along the way. But there are a lot of, I can give you a long list of things that are happening today that are good things that weren't happening five years ago on the business front, um, corporations and things like that. So, yes, I am an optimist, but I'm only optimistic if all of us work on it together. And, and conversations like this, Linda, are very important to share. And so I really appreciate that. Well, thank you so much for talking to me today. Thank you. Stephen Rothstein is the founding managing director of the Cirrus Accelerator for Sustainable Capital Markets.